Hello, multivariable calculus scholar. Upfront warning, what we're about ready to discuss probably isn't going to help you in class. Again, hello, multivariable calculus scholar. And judging by the fact that you're still here with me, I think that name for you is very suiting. So what I'd like to talk today is about more about the understanding, um, sort of the fundamental understanding of what actually divergence and curl is and how it actually connects to the, the mathematical formula. Because this is it's not really intuitively obvious, um, particularly because that del operator, that nabla, is not really something physical like you can just really um, grasp by itself. That's what kind of makes this difficult. Um, I can say, to be honest, I got a PhD in electrical engineering, which is really fundamentally based on Maxwell's equations, which are based on divergence and curl, yet I didn't really understand what divergence and curl were, to be honest. Um, you could still do well if you don't understand it. You can just crank through the numbers. But if you do understand, you'll really have a fundamental understanding to the core of what is actually going on. And that's, that's really powerful. And I hope you find that that's also um, satisfying, too. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at what Grant Sanderson did with his uh, three blue, one brown video, which he gives a really cool, intuitive um, understanding of what the dot and the cross product meaning are behind divergence and curl. And then we'll move on from that and, and go even even a little bit deeper than what than what he does into the actual formula a little bit more. Commonly, the divergence is written as a dot product between this upside down triangle thing and your vector field function, and the curl is written as a similar cross product. Sometimes students are told that this is just a notational trick. Each computation involves a certain sum of certain derivatives and treating this upside down triangle as if it was a vector of derivative operators can be a helpful way to keep everything straight. But it is actually more than just a mnemonic device. There is a real connection between divergence and the dot product and between curl and the cross product. Even though we won't be doing practice computations here, I would like to give you at least some vague sense for how these four ideas are connected. All right, let's just pause it here for a second and just make sure you're, you're tracking here with the dot and the cross product by way of review. Um, so the dot product visual here on the left, um, this, you notice that this number here gives um, the value of our dot product and that dot product of the vectors is zero when these vectors are perpendicular and it reaches its maximum value when these vectors are parallel. And moving over here to the cross product, um, recall that unlike the dot product, the cross product gives you a vector. But um, its magnitude um, will give you the area of a parallelogram that would be formed between these vectors. So this area is maximized here when the vectors are perpendicular and minimized to zero when the vectors are parallel. So the dot and the cross products, they don't necessarily exclude each other. Um, you can have positive values for both, but you sort of maximize one by minimizing the other, and vice versa. And we'll see that um, divergence and curl really behave in a similar way that the dot and cross product do. Imagine taking some small step from one point of your vector field to another. The vector at this new point will likely be a little bit different from the one at the first point. There will be some change to the function after that step, which you might see by subtracting off your original vector from that new one. And this kind of difference to your function over small steps is what differential calculus is all about. Now, the dot product gives you kind of a measure of how aligned two vectors are, right? Now, the dot product of your step vector with that difference vector that it causes tends to be positive in regions where the divergence is positive, and vice versa. In fact, in some sense, the divergence is a sort of average value for this dot product, of a step with a change to the output that it causes over all possible step directions, assuming that things are rescaled appropriately. I mean, think about it. If a step in some direction causes a change to that vector in that same direction, this corresponds to a tendency for outward flow, for positive divergence. And on the flip side, if those dot products tend to be negative, meaning the difference vector is pointing in the opposite direction from the step vector, that corresponds with the tendency for inward flow, negative divergence. So Grant gives a brilliant concept of how divergence behaves like a dot product. But if you had some difficulty following exactly what that formula was, um, you're not alone because it's really not a direct connection. Um, if we look at this um, equation here, the divergence 
of our vector field is equal to our del operator dot product our vector field. But it's not like one of these is the step and the other is the difference that um, that Grant's showing in his, in his video. So it's not like a direct, there's not a direct connection between what he's showing in the math here. All right, and the reason this is difficult under, to understand is because this um, del operator, it's not a physical actual entity. It's just um, something that's trying to operate on something else. You could sort of think of it like a, um, a parasite or, um, or a virus, if you will. It's like by itself, it can't self-replicate. It can't really do much. It needs a host. It needs something to latch onto in order to, to do its thing. But as, uh, as Grant previously mentioned, we defined our del operator as this, uh, as this vector with a um, partial with respect to x for its x component and a partial with respect to y for its y component. So um, it's a vector partial derivative, but it's meaningless alone. It needs, it needs a host. It needs something to differentiate. And that thing it's going to act on here is our vector field f, which we define as the vector p for x component and q for the y component. So our divergence of f is the dot product of these two, which we take one step further and we end up with del p del x plus del q del y. So first, let's take a look at the del p del x portion. So let's just imagine, like kind of like Grant was showing, we got our initial vector here at the origin. And then if we step over one to the right, we get this new vector, uh, it's called v sub 1. And let's go ahead and define some uh, quantities here. Let's say for our um, origin vector, this distance that it goes in our x direction is, we'll call that p sub zero. And if we go look at our v1, the distance it goes in the x direction, we'll call that p sub one. So um, what we're really trying to find here, this del p, we'll call it, we'll call that our delta p here and it's going to be the difference in the, those x components and our del x is going to be the, the distance of that step. So you could say um, our, our del p del x is approximately e equal to what we've shown here, our delta p over delta x, which is going to be our um, p1 minus p naught on the numerator and our del x on the bottom. So that's where we get that um, del p del x term. And notice that it's um, it doesn't, this component, we don't care what the y value is for this. So we could have a vector here or here, but that's still gonna have the same del p, del x component. And you notice that del p is gonna be positive in this case because that our new vector is um, has a larger x component. So del p is positive. Okay, now let's take a look at our del q, del y component. So for this, we're gonna go ahead and take a step up in this y direction. And that step's gonna be our delta y and say this is our, our new vector here, then our del q is just going to be the difference in the y component of those two vectors. And note in this case, our del q is actually going to be negative because when we went up in the y direction, our new vector um, became smaller with its y component. So we can approximate our del q del y in this case as our delta q over our delta y, which in this case is gonna be negative. Um, so in this case, our um, divergence um, looks like it's probably going to end up being positive because it looks like the um, del p, del x component's a little bit bigger than the, our negative uh, del q, del y component. But you see these are kind of acting counter to each other. But that's really it for um, divergence. That's really all it is. And let's uh, move on to Grant's explanation of curl net. Similarly, remember that the cross product is a sort of measure for how perpendicular two vectors are. So the cross product of your step vector with the difference vector that it causes tends to be positive in regions where the curl is positive and vice versa. You might think of the curl as a sort of average of this step vector difference vector cross product. If a step in some direction corresponds to a change perpendicular to that step, that corresponds to a tendency for flow rotation. Okay, cool. So again, Grant is visually showing this um, curl as our step, cross product, or difference. Um, but again, so our actual equation for curl of f is going to be our um, nabla, cross product, our vector field. And of course, this isn't our, it's not like our nabla is the step vector and our, our f is, um, is our difference vector. So uh, um, this equation turns out to be, it, it turns out to be pretty simple what's going on here, but um, the equation for curl is, um, is a little bit more complex than what we had for divergence. And um, 
one of the reasons is because the curl doesn't really make sense um, for um, a 2D vector. So we have to think of F as a three-dimensional vector now, which um, isn't too big of a stretch. We're just going to use the same notation for F. We're just going to add in um, this R component for the Z, and we're just going to set that equal to zero. So it's really the same vector field. Um, we ju we're just um, showing that that Z component is zero um, when we work through this. Um, so if we go ahead and expand out this curl function, this del across f, we get this sort of determinant here. And if we want to take this one step further, we can um, go ahead and write out our resulting i, j, and k components. And this is the equation we end up with. And yeah, it looks, it looks kind of complex and a little scary, but a lot of this stuff cancels out. So if you just bear with me for a minute. Um, imagine we've, we've already set this r component equal to zero. So we can go ahead and set this um, R component is zero here in our equation. So these del R's are going to um, cancel out. So we can go ahead and cross those out. So we're getting simpler. And um, another um, maybe less obvious thing that we can do here is cancel out these um, partials with respect to Z. And that's because we're this um, vector field we're working with, it's not going to change when we move up or down in the Z direction. We've just set that Z component equal to zero. So if you want to see it visually, you could imagine it like We've got this um, vector field. We can show it in 3D. But if we if we move up or down in our z direction, it just stays the same. So there's no there's no change when you change there's no change in p or q when you're changing your z. So based on that, we can go ahead and cross out our del p del z term and our del q terms. And if we do that, this equation actually becomes pretty simple. It's just um, k hat times del q del x minus del p del, del y. So you can see this is actually pretty similar now to the, um, what we needed to find the divergence, um, except notice that, that um, these terms are crossed now, hence the term cross product, right? We've got the um, del Q over del X. We, we're, taking, we're looking at the, the change in the Y component, del Q, um, when we step over in our X direction. So if we just take a look at that here, let's say this, is, this was our vector, right? And before we looked at del P, but now we're going to look at the del Q component here. So you can see our del Q up here is going to be positive. So we're going to have a positive del Q del X component um, for this vector field at this point. And now we can go ahead and look at our um, del P del Y component. So when we step up that step in our del Y, we're looking at the del P now. And you can see that we're going to have this del P um, in this case, it's going to be negative because our new vector shifted over um, to the left with its um, x component. So we're going to have a negative del p del y. All right, so we're finding those, finding those components. We can go ahead and combine these to find our curl in this case. And we noticed that our del q del x was positive. And we noticed since our del p del y is negative, that's actually going to make our curl magnitude become more positive um, because we have the minus sign here. So you can see that we're going to end up with a positive curl um, in this area. So if you can imagine, if we put a little twig here in this quadrant, it's getting pushed up on its right side, and it's getting pushed left on its top. So that's going to cause it to rotate counterclockwise. And of course, we know that this counterclockwise spin refers to a positive curl. And um, one other thing I'd like to mention um, with regards to both divergence and curl is that Grant sort of referred to them as this sort of an average if you take all these dot or cross products going around. Um, but it turns out, I mean, the math is actually a lot simpler than that. We don't really have to, um, we don't have to take any, there's no averages um, going on here. All we're doing is we're taking this sort of this little square we're working with, and we're going to reduce our del y and our del x to kind of um, bring this square smaller and smaller until we're just looking at what's the divergence and curl at a certain point. There's really no averaging here. We just got to look at our del P del X, our del Q del Y, our del Q del X, and our del P del Y. There's basically four terms that we look at. And if we find those four terms, then we know exactly what our divergence and curl is at this particular point. And one other thing to note with our divergence and curl here is that while they can both be positive, like we have in this case, they don't necessarily exclude each other. But if we want to really want to maximize one, we're going to minimize the other and vice versa. So they really do behave in a very similar way that um, cross and dot product do. So hopefully this helps you connect the intuition and the math and the formulas um, a little bit better. If um, 
you have any questions or comments, please let me know. And until next time, take care.